Welcome back. In this video, we look at how higher level languages are compiled into machine code. The first step is that the higher level language, in this case we're considering a C program, is translated by the compiler into assembly language. Then the assembler translates the assembly code into machine code. The result will be object files. During this process, the assembler creates a symbol table to match labels to addresses. All object files, which may consist of user files as well as system files, are linked together by the linker into one executable. This executable stays on disk until we're ready to run it. When we're ready to run it, the loader loads the executable into memory. Note that modern compilers can also compile directly from a higher level language to machine code without going through the assembly language step. The object files are linked by the linker, also called a link editor, into one executable file. To do this, it has to place code and data symbolically in memory and figure out addresses for data and instruction labels and patching up all internal and external references. The loader is responsible for loading the executable file into memory. It has to find address space for it, copy it into memory, copy any parameters to the main program onto the stack, initialize registers, and set the stack pointer. Then it will jump to a startup routine that starts main and monitor it finally returning control to the system upon program completion. The way I've just described the linking and loading are older methods called static linking. It's not done much anymore for a couple of good reasons. One is that the library routines become part of the executable. And if the library is updated, the executable still has the old code. This can maintain security vulnerabilities in legacy code. The second problem is it loads all libraries that are called anywhere, which is going to bloat the executable. So dynamically linked libraries are a more modern approach. In dynamic linking, library calls are represented by a placeholder that points to the routine. When a routine is called, the linker loader finds it and loads it into memory. And thereafter, it'll be in memory ready to be called directly. A further enhancement is lazy loading which is not going to bother to even link a routine until after it's called the first time. This is in contrast to traditional DLL, which links but doesn't load every routine potentially called in the executable. You'll want to read the textbook section 212 about static versus dynamic linking, DLL, and lazy loading, since there'll be a couple of questions on the next test about these concepts. In summary, a statically linked approach has an executable containing library object code which makes the executable larger than DLL. In DLL, the executable will be smaller, but DLL is slightly slower because the system has to go find the libraries at runtime. This is worth the reduction in speed for security reasons. The library that is fetched will be the most recently updated library and assumably the most secure code. For this video, the remaining portions will not be on a test, but I've included them because I think they're things that are important for programmers to know. The first thing I want to discuss is how programs are compiled. How do compilers work? You can take a whole course on compiler design, it's such a big subject, but here I just want to give the big picture. Compilers are written specifically for a higher level language on a given CPU family running a specific operating system. The compiler's front end translates the higher level language to a machine independent intermediary language. The front end will be unique for every language. For example, the front end for C will be different than the front end for C++. After the intermediate representation is created, the code goes through several layers of optimizations. The last stage will generate the machine code or in some cases, the assembly code. Let's look at what it takes to convert a simple while loop in a higher level language to the intermediate code. First, the code is parsed into tokens. Tokens are reserved words, user-defined identifiers, operators, numbers, and punctuation. 
The tokens are then parsed into a syntax tree in a way that's somewhat like how you would parse an English sentence words into a tree diagram. The compiler will follow the rules of syntax for that particular language. Here's an example of an intermediate form. Notice it looks similar to MIPS, but it's not exactly MIPS. The biggest difference we see that our registers are represented by R and then a number. And in this stage, it's assumed that there are an unlimited number of registers. The registers will be assigned at a later stage. There are many different optimizations. Here are a few of the most important ones. Strength reduction is replacing a slow instruction, like MULT, with a faster instruction, like SHIFT. Dead store elimination gets rid of stores to memory that are not used again, and dead code elimination gets rid of code that's not executed or doesn't affect the rest of the program. Now you might think, why would a program have dead code in it? If you think about code that's been worked on by many different programmers over years and perhaps decades, it is very possible that it could have dead code in there, and the compiler will find it. A really important optimization is loop unrolling. This takes the body of the loop and duplicates it, adjusting the indices as needed. This results in fewer jumps and branches. Another optimization is sub-expression elimination. So here we have x sub i equals x sub i plus 4. This can be rewritten in such a way so that the address x sub i only needs to be calculated once. What about interpreted languages like Java? Java is compiled into Java bytecode. We see an example of Java bytecode on the right. And then it's this Java bytecode that's executed by the Java virtual machine. Java's philosophy is write it once, run it anywhere, so the Java virtual machine can take Java bytecode and interpret it for a given hardware. Looking at the Java bytecode, you might notice that it looks a lot like an assembly language. Comparing Java and MIPS, we observe that Java uses a stack instead of registers for operations. Operands are pushed on the stack, operated on, and then popped off. MIPS instructions are always 4 bytes. Java bytecode instructions vary from 1 to 5 bytes because the original designers at the time were concerned about conserving memory. There are advantages to compiled languages and there are advantages to interpreted languages. A compiled language has to be recompiled for every machine type, but that compiled code is highly optimized for that machine. The advantage of interpreted languages is that they don't have to be recompiled, but they tend to be a bit slower. Interpreted languages have found ways to make the code faster. For example, Java has the just-in-time compiler as a part of the Java virtual machine. This will find blocks of codes that are run repeatedly and optimize them for native code on that machine. Other interpreted languages get speed up by having libraries that are written in faster languages like C or C++. Now that you've learned an assembly language, it's interesting to step back and think about how higher level languages abstract away from assembly language. Early assembly languages and higher level languages had things like go-tos, global variables, and functions. Some of these things caused problems in large programs, and so that led to improvements in higher level languages, basically concealing details, for example, functions with scope. And there were still problems, so that led to further concealment with objects that have getter and setter helpers. What's next on the horizon? Well, machine learning, obviously, but there will always be a need for coded programs. My big brother told me when I was a computer science undergrad back in 1980 that I shouldn't study computer science because soon computers would be able to program themselves. It hasn't happened yet, and I think there will be a huge need for programmers going forward. What I've always enjoyed about programming is that it combines logic and creativity. If you just read this quote and didn't know it was from John Locke, where he's talking about combining simple ideas into compound ones, uniting ideas to get relations, and abstraction, you might think he was talking about programming. 
but he's talking about ways to express and develop ideas. And that's all a program is, is an expression of an idea. It's a creative expression. We can express ourselves creatively through music, art, poetry, math and logic, or code. And the idioms by which we communicate the symbols of our poetry and code are things like conditionals, loops, and functions. Sometimes after I explain compiler optimizations like loop unrolling, someone will ask, well, should I do things like loop unrolling in a higher level language in my code? The answer is no, for a couple of reasons. One is that you should let the compiler optimize the code. If you do something unusual and unexpected, the compiler may not recognize what you were trying to do. But the most important reason is this quote from the book Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. And this is an important maxim to always keep in mind. Programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. Now let's talk about everyone's least favorite subject, documentation. We're all guilty of writing the code and later going back and writing the documentation just because we have to. But we can help ourselves and our fellow programmers a lot by following a few simple guidelines. Our logic should be written in a way that's easy to read. It should be modular so we can break a huge problem down into bite-sized pieces. Your code style should be internally consistent and you should document both internally and externally. Of course, we need to test and verify our code as much as possible. And we should consider efficiency. And this is the best guideline. When you write code, think of the person who will have to maintain it, because it might just be you. Here's a simple program demonstrating some ideas about internal documentation in assembly language. So often when I start a program, I will actually start with the comments, which here I'm showing off to the side. Sometimes I'll put them in the code themselves. That essentially forms my algorithm, breaking what I want to accomplish in this program down into bite-sized steps. Between each step of a program, I like to put a blank space here. This separates the ideas. It makes it easier to figure out what's going on. I also like to use white space between the opcode and the operands just to make it more readable. White space is one of the most important things you can do to make your code readable. One way you can do external documentation very easily is with Markdown. I have a Markdown cheat sheet in the GitHub, and here's a quick demo using Atom, although you can use Markdown in many other kinds of programs. The idea of Markdown is that you do the formatting while you're typing without having to lift your hands off the keyboard. Then when you want to render it into the output, you say, in Atom at least, you say Control shift m and we see how it rendered. So notice that the hashtags of different numbers give different sizes of headings. The fewer the hashtags, the larger the heading. When you put two asterisks around text, it makes it bold. When you put a single asterisk around text, it makes it italics. You can even do bulleted lists and sample code with backticks. Speaking of GitHub, I think everyone should have a GitHub account. It gives you a place to showcase your coding projects. If you're working on projects with Teams, it's a great help. And keep in mind it's free for public repositories. In the GitHub, I have some basics on getting started with GitHub from the command line. But you don't have to use the command line to use GitHub. This is a great place for potential employers to find you and look at what you've done and see what kinds of projects you can do. But don't put your homework out there. Only original projects. Because you're going to get some idiot in trouble, or worse, give him a grade he doesn't deserve, which dilutes your grade. In the later parts of this video, I've talked about a lot of things that will never show up on a test or a quiz. But I think they're important in our goal of becoming better and better at our craft. Mm -hmm.